What are you supposed to do when your favorite designer is a creep, or at least is allegedly so? Yeah, I'm talking about Gosha Rubchinsky, and I have the pleasure, or maybe displeasure depending on how you look at it, of owning a ton of Gosha stuff. I counted and there is no single designer I own more things by. I have a bunch of t-shirts designed by him, both graphic tees and ones with his classic Cyrillic alphabet text. I've got this green one that I still honestly wear all the time because it's so comfy and I love the design of it. I have his collaboration with Fila. I have his collaboration with Mumi Troll. I've got pieces from his skateboarding label Rosvet and their collaboration with Dover Street Market. And I even have a full sweatsuit by GR Uniforma. So in this video, we're going to talk about who Gosha is, how he became so popular, and what led to his downfall in a way. And finally, we're going to talk about how to navigate that as a consumer who still enjoys his designs. So stick around, it's going to be a spicy one. Oh, and hey, before I forget, subscribe to my channel. If you're into this video, you'll probably be into a bunch of my other ones, so get into it. For a hot minute there, Gosha Rubchinsky was perhaps the hottest streetwear designer on the planet. He's still hugely influential, just more quietly so, for reasons we'll get into in a bit. He now has the GR Uniforma and Rosvet labels in his stable of Gosha brands on top of his eponymous label. Gosha has long been a champion of a Russian youth culture, something that has a different connotation knowing what we know now about him, but is significant nonetheless. He's actually been designing since 2008, which may surprise many because he seemingly came out of nowhere in 2014 or so. A connection with a Russian Vogue editor in 2009 set things off for him, but despite getting lots of attention, it wasn't a financial success. This led Gosha to put the brand on hold for a couple years, but a meeting with the president of Comme des Garçons, Adrian Jaffe, changed everything. They struck a deal that meant Rubchinsky designs his collections while CDG handles everything else. And I mean everything. CDG produce the clothes, distribute them, market them. They even own the name Gosha Rubchinsky, believe it or not. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that without Comme des Garçons, we wouldn't even know who Gosha is. After signing with CDG, the doors of fashion opened wide to Gosha. His profile rose fast and led to collaborations with Adidas, Levi's, Doc Martens, Reebok, and even Burberry. But a good distribution network alone won't blow you up. The designs have to be good. So what was it about Gosha's designs that spoke to people so much? Gosha himself has called his style a mix of sportswear with a nightclub rave feeling. His use of Cyrillic is predictable considering his nationality, but also genius. The big bold text and graphics on tees make them look like a souvenir piece from a defunct Soviet state, and to western eyes, the language is the perfect eye catcher. At first it appears to be English and you want to read it, before realizing it's a different language entirely a twist on the familiar. Gosha's rise also coincided with a couple of big changes in the streetwear scene and style. First, a rise in European footballer culture was bubbling up. Think of other brands that gained massive heat at the time, like Palace or Noah. And then there was also the resurgence of Russian nightclub styles. For examples there, look no further than the return of the gaudy tracksuit, something that even the Gucci's and Louis Vuitton's of the world quickly picked up on. All of these elements, along with the reach that CDG provided, turned out to be the perfect recipe to launch Gosha to the stratosphere. The thing is, you really don't hear his name much anymore. He seemed to be everywhere one day and then gone the next. What happened? Well, to be frank, some pretty compelling evidence came out that Gosha's fascination with the youth was more than academic. In 2018, a 16-year-old male model released DMs showing Gosha begging for nude photos. Another model followed with similar allegations shortly thereafter. The DMs from Gosha featured such gems as, send me now something from the bathroom, and you can go to the bathroom and do it quickly, please. That's pretty damning stuff. So he was canceled immediately, right? 
Well, not necessarily. Gosha immediately got the PR spin moving in his favor. His representative claimed this was just how he staffed his runway shows, saying that Gosha cast through Instagram and often required photos of models in their underwear to make his determination. This alone is pretty eyebrow raising stuff in and of itself. And if this were true, without ulterior motives, I'd say it is still a huge abuse of power and status. But then consider the urgency and pushiness with which he requested these photos. I guess if you wanted to be generous, you could assume that he was on a tight schedule to hire his models, but I still think that is quite a stretch. Even more disappointing was the statement by Gosha's benefactor, CDG's Adrian Jaffe. He took a proto anti cancel culture approach to the whole thing, which would make guys like Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder proud today. He said, I abhor the mob mentality of social media and the guilty until proved innocent syndrome, which seems to be the order of the day. While I deeply deplore the abuse of power in any industry, I am waiting for the whole truth to come out. Of course, waiting for the whole truth in this case unsurprisingly turned out to be waiting for people to stop paying attention, because nothing more has come from the matter since. And let's look a little further there and break that quote down fully, because there are a bunch of really gross characterizations and deflections going on there. First, he says, I abhor the mom mentality. So clearly, he places more blame on the public's focus on the allegations than he does on the allegations themselves. Then he decries the guilty until proved innocent syndrome, here implicitly indicating that Gosha will be proven innocent in the future. Then he says the one thing that on the surface seems compassionate and thoughtful, which is, I deeply deplore the abuse of power in any industry. But the important point there is the broadness of saying any industry. He's not saying he hates abuse of power in the fashion industry, or God forbid in his industry. No, he hates it in any industry, thus implying that abuse of power happens in other industries rather than the one he exists in. And if it does exist in his industry, then it's not really all that bad because it can happen in any industry, can't it? Finally, he states that he is waiting for the whole truth to come out. Of course, reading between the lines there, it's clear that he feels the truth has not yet come out. The information that had come out at that point were the allegations themselves, and thus Joffe indicates that those allegations are not, in fact, the truth. Where does that leave us in current year? I think it's safe to say that this wouldn't fly if it happened today. In 2020, Gosha would probably be fully cancelled rather than what happened, which was Gosha continuing his influence just with new labels that didn't overtly have his name attached to them. So that's why you don't really hear about Gosha anymore. People with some clout still really like his designs and are probably afraid of the power he and CDG wield, so the influencers and YouTubers and stockists and the industry at large just kind of stay quiet. While that's better than pretending it never happened and putting Gosha on a pedestal, it still shields him from having to take actual responsibility. Now, do I agree with the allegations and attempted canceling of Gosha? It's not really for me to say. I don't know any of the people involved, and I don't know the full truth. But there is enough squickiness here for me to keep my distance. Just because I don't know the full truth about R. Kelly or Chris Brown doesn't mean I have to support them. So I still love my Gosha stuff and wear it proudly because they're great designs and I think they're really iconic pieces of streetwear that will stand the test of time regardless of the actions of the designer. However, since this information came out, I've made sure that whenever I buy something from one of his labels, I do so in a way that does not financially benefit Gosha himself, because I don't feel comfortable putting my money in his pocket. What does that mean? It means I get his stuff from Grailed, Depop, Vestiaire Collective, and the like. If you feel that his actions are so abhorrent that you won't even wear his stuff, I can't argue with that. But if you're questioning things, I suggest you follow my lead at least and don't give him your money. If you like his designs, as I do, there are other ways to get them. And hey, let me know your thoughts. Do you own Gosha stuff or want to own it? Do you still wear it? Do you just leave it in the closet? Have you sold it all? I want to know. And I guess that's it. So thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to this channel, watch the other video on screen, and I'll see you next time.